Nine months ago, I began work on a voxel game engine. It started out as a simple ray marcher, able to draw some cubes and not much else. But with a few iterations, some custom algorithms, and lots of elbow grease, I've managed to go from that little program to this. This is Douglas, and today, I'll be sharing my rendering pipeline for this beautiful, dynamic scene. I'm especially excited about this devlog, because alongside it, I've released a demo of my engine. It's available to play in browser now, so if you're interested, please have a look at the description. I'll talk a bit more about the demo at the end of this video. When we left off in the previous devlog, I had an excellent proof of concept. Using a technique I refer to as parallax ray marching, I had shown that it was possible to display large numbers of voxels, even on integrated GPUs. You can learn about this in more detail by watching my fourth devlog, but the core concept is quite simple. To draw voxel volumes, we group them into sets of 8x8x8 boxes, and rasterize the boxes. Then, we paint the outside of them, so it appears as though they contain voxels from the camera's perspective. It's a neat trick, because the GPU only has to process the boxes, and not each voxel individually, it can deal with much more data. All that the CPU has to do is generate the boxes, and upload the voxel data that each box contains to the GPU. Still, my proof of concept was imperfect. It stored the voxel data for each box as a big texture on the GPU, requiring one texture for every 256 cubed chunk of voxels, and the algorithm for actually meshing each voxel octree was naive and slow. If I wanted things to scale, and be able to draw many chunks, I would need to redesign the way that I stored my data. So, I dived in, completely changing how parallax boxes are represented and drawn. The new format, while being much more efficient, also allows for some key optimizations in my rendering pipeline. In short, the rendering pipeline now works like this. A memory allocator creates some space for a voxel mesh to be loaded in. The parallax boxes visible on an octree's surface are stored in buffers and textures and sent to the GPU. Three different face calling techniques are applied as optimizations depending upon the orientation of the camera. Then, the data is rendered on screen and in shadow maps. Let's talk about each of these in detail. First is the GPU memory allocator. If I wanted to have countless different voxel objects, each one having their own vertex buffers and textures would be wildly inefficient. Conventional OpenGL wisdom is to group similar objects together, so you don't have to switch resources like vertex buffer objects too often. Luckily for me, all of my objects are rendered in the exact same way. So I took this concept to the extreme. I decided to have all of my voxel chunks share one big vertex buffer and a few big textures. To do this, I would need a way to swiftly share resources between them, and that's where the GPU allocator is involved. I'm quite happy with how it turned out. It's a zero-cost abstraction over the concept of a resource which is anything that can be broken into fixed size chunks called pages. A page can be anything, a segment of a buffer, or a cube in a 3D texture, for example. This allows me to use the same memory allocator to share both buffer and 3D texture resources. The allocator scheme itself is very simple. 
It stores empty and filled pages as a big string of bits, and then uses bitwise operations to identify, 64 pages at a time, contiguous, empty regions of pages. This makes it very fast and very good at managing the memory of a large number of similarly sized allocations. Now that I had a way to dish out resources between voxel objects, it was time to generate and store them on the GPU. To do this efficiently, I take advantage of how my voxels are stored as voxel octrees. The algorithm starts at the highest octree level and searches for solid regions. If it finds some, it marks the 8x8x8 parallax boxes on the surface as visible. Otherwise, it recurses down subsequent levels of the octree and repeats the procedure. Once the parallax boxes necessary for rendering are known, each box is converted to a GPU data. First, the 8x8x8 voxel cube is copied to a flat array and tightly packed into a 3D texture called the materials map. This information is used by the GPU when it is painting voxels on each parallax box. In addition, so that the GPU knows where each box is in 3D space, the faces of the box are written to a buffer. Each face uses 16 bytes of data. Four bytes identify the corresponding location in the materials map, and the other 12 identify the four corner positions of the face, three bytes for each corner. Since everything is tightly stored in textures and arrays, and only surface visible boxes are actually stored on the GPU, memory consumption isn't a big problem. Let's quickly recap what has been done so far. Using a memory allocator, data for all voxel objects has been grouped into a single set of buffers on the GPU. We've loaded the necessary voxel data into these buffers, along with the visible faces of each parallax box. To actually draw the data, now, we need to invoke the glDraw commands for each face. Previously, I was simply telling OpenGL to draw all parallax boxes every frame, but we can make some immense optimizations in this area, because in any 3D scene, only a small subset of objects and faces are actually visible. Using CPU side face calling, where we tell OpenGL to only draw a subset and eliminate the rest of the faces, we can save on vertex shader invocations and have zero cost performance gains. To capitalize on this, I implemented three rounds of CPU side face calling, frustum calling, octant calling, and directional calling. At any point in time, the camera in the 3D scene has a given view frustum, a pyramid looking shape within which all visible objects reside. Only the 256 cube voxel chunks which intersect with the view frustum will be visible. Any other chunks don't need to be sent to the GPU, since we know they won't show up anyhow. As such, I perform frustum calling by determining the projection matrix for the camera frustum, expanded by the length of a chunk in each direction, and then transforming chunk corners into that projection space. If all chunk corners are outside the modified projection space, then nothing needs to be drawn and the chunk is simply elided from rendering, saving vertex shader invocations. The other two calling techniques capitalize on a special property of voxels. They only ever have six axis aligned faces. So if we segregate them by face direction, which my algorithm does when generating GPU data, then we can selectively render the face directions based upon which ones should be visible. Octant calling is based on the property that if an object is on only one side of the camera, then only half of its faces need to be drawn. So, for chunks that are totally on the right of the camera, we don't need to render the faces that point right there's no way that they would be visible anyhow. 
The same goes for the left, down, up, back, and front directions as well. In the case where a chunk resides in a single octant rel relative to the camera, only half of its faces will ever be visible. So we call the back half. Last is directional calling, which eliminates some extra faces that octant calling misses. Directional calling is very simple. For each frame direction, if that direction points away from the camera, then there's no way the camera can see it. Thus, we call the face. Using these three techniques, I'm able to save unthinkable amounts of vertex shader indications. At any given time, the engine only renders between 20 to 40% of total triangles loaded in the scene. This allows me to push things farther and render more voxels. All of this calling is implemented on top of the GL multi-draw functionality. Because everything is in one big buffer, all my engine has to do is generate a list of all subsets of the buffer that need to be drawn, and then send them to the GPU in a single draw call. This is the peak of my CPU side rendering optimizations, which cut down on driver overhead. An especially important feature on a platform like the web where GL calls need to go through JavaScript, which is <laughs> terribly slow. Finally, each face is drawn on the GPU with a shader designed for parallax ray marching. Anytime the scene changes, a shadow map is also calculated to allow for the lighting effects you can see here. The lighting updates any time that the scene changes when voxels are edited or destroyed, or chunks load in. This means that, during most frames, the expensive lighting calculations of parallax ray marching aren't run because updates don't occur every frame which is another great optimization. The fact that I render my geometry in two passes, one for the big static part of the scene, and the other for small dynamic objects, means that I'm still able to apply this optimization when the scene contains moving shadow casters. That's it. Coupling parallax ray marching with some clever CPU side optimizations, memory allocation, and calling I have a massively detailed voxel renderer. I'd like to give credit here to this article, linked in the description, that was the inspiration for a number of the calling optimizations. It was quite influential and a great starting point for my work. If you're still curious about the project, you can check out a demo online, which incorporates all of the features discussed here. Some quick disclaimers about the demo. First, performance-wise, note that most web browsers implement 60 FPS frame caps for VSync. So if you're wondering why the frame rate doesn't go higher than that with a good GPU, that's probably why. Not to worry, there will be a desktop version of the engine when it releases for maximum performance. Secondly, bear in mind that the website is a technical demo, nothing more. So. Please do check out the demo and tell me if it doesn't work or what you like and don't like, but know that it is far from finished and I have a lot to add. Aside from eating and sleeping, I've been working on this project essentially nonstop. There's so much more I wish I could share. Details about the chunk loading system and procedural world generation, for example. But those things will have to wait for a future video. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to implementing more features, like transparency, lighting, and physics into the engine. Please leave a like and subscribe, and don't forget to ask questions in the comment section. I'd be delighted to talk details. Otherwise, thanks for watching, have a fantastic day.